the best years of our lives, Ben Hur and Funny Girl. And he said, George, when I hired Rosa, I fell in love with classical music. Leonard Bernstein dominated the classical world in the mid 20th century. He was equally prodigious in his talent as a composer, conductor, impresario, with direct ethnic roots from war torn Austria. His immortal score for West Side Story was recently redone in a new film two years ago by Stephen Sondheim, Steven Spielberg, using members of the Broadway 2019 cast that closed during the pandemic. The film was nominated for Best Picture. As a young man, his mother, Spielberg's mother, took him to concerts in LA to hear Leonard Bernstein, and he heard him. And when Spielberg was working on his first film, Jaws, Bernstein said to him, you have to have a score. He said, I have no composer. I said, the perfect match. I've got a young Jewish composer out of Juilliard named John Williams, they've stayed together, together, Spielberg and Williams, Spielberg's entire career. John Williams has been nominated for an astonishing 51 Oscars and won seven. Composer and theatrical magic-making Marvin Emlich, born of Viennese Jewish parents, the only person apart from Richard Rodgers, to have won an Oscar, a Tony, a Grammy, and an Emmy as well. Leaving us all too soon in 2014, his Oscar-winning score, you'll recognize this, my friend, for the film The Way We Were, bring nostalgic memories to all of us. When Barbara Streisand signed that contract to work with Robert Redford on that film, The Way We Were, in her contract, she said, if there's a score and a song, it must be with Marvin Hamlish. And they agreed. Hamlish went to Juilliard at age 14. And when they were casting and producing a new Broadway show called Funny Girl, Julie Stein called Juilliard and said, I need someone to help score the music. They sent over the 14-year-older, and the rest is history. His parents' musical roots in Vienna greatly influenced the young prodigy who entered Juilliard School at age 14. At age 18, he helped launch the careers of Barbara Streisand and Funny Girl, the first album of Liza Minnelli. And while composing the score for The Way We Were, he rewrote the score of The Sting. Now here's a moment in Oscar history. Astonishingly, I learned a year ago that at the 1974 Academy Awards, Marvin Hamlish won an unprecedented three Oscars that night, Best Original Score and Best Original Song for The Way We Were. And on the same night, he won a third Oscar for the musical adaptation of the score of The Sting. Seen here presenting them to him, Donald O'Connor, Debbie Reynolds, and Cher. His funeral in August of 2014 in New York drew international attention and colleagues gathered to pay respect to this beloved composer who affected the lives of people around the world. Seen here are President Bill Clinton, Barbara Streisand, and Liza Minnelli. Hopefully, my friends, you're able to understand the importance that Vienna and its music have had upon the human experience. Consider for a moment the Alpine village of Dornburn near Salzburg, where on a Christmas Eve long ago, the church organist Franz Gruber was unable to work the organ. And taking guitar in hand, he wrote a simple song, Silent Night, which even today evokes childhood memories. Austria, known for its implicitly beautiful countryside with this majestic help certainly influenced the young Beethoven when he wrote his sixth symphony, the pastoral. Further consideration of the variety of summer and winter sports, tourism, excellent cuisine, and people who pride themselves on showcasing their beautiful country. <clears throat> 
is no wonder that travelers come from around the world to explore its many treasures. Vienna has become the center of academic advances throughout history. The venerated University of Vienna was founded in 1365, the center to the great medieval colleges of Europe. Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein both conducted classes at the University of Vienna. Within an environment of musical acumen, the three tenors entertained there many times on Christmas Eve concerts. The turn of the century brought about a new age of art in Vienna, the period of Viennese secession. The turn of the century was a time of international firmament in Vienna. This was the age of Freud and secession. At this time, such artists as Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele were changing the contemporary art scene. And architects Otto Wagner and Louis Alfred Loos created revolutionary new styles. This was all set against the decaying Habsburg Empire. We see here the Kirsch on Steinhof designed by Otto Wagner. Decorated by Kolo Mosser, one of the major contributions to succession. The visual arts had been a critical component of the Viennese culture, while well, Gustav Klimt was painting bucolic scenes of Austria. In a world of change during the early decades of the 20th century, Klimt's metaphorical paintings, seen here the kiss, full of gold and glitter in a world falling apart with the rise of Nazi Germany, anti-Semitism, and the coming of World War II. Gustav Klimt depicted erotic glittering art that characterized his early work. His most famous painting, The Kiss, was painted in 1907. Many of his great works can be seen in Vienna's Kunstlerhaus, the art house, including this multi Panel freeze, the Beethoven freeze. This painting, this one and four other group works, belong to the Altman family of Vienna and were seized by the Germans during the Vienna Holocaust. And they had been housed until 15 years ago in the Belvedere Palace in Vienna. Until the State Department and Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg were involved in an international case to return the five paintings to Los Angeles Holocaust survivor Maria Altman, whose aunt was the subject of the paintings. She was the niece of the subject of the prodigious Clint painting. In 2012, the five paintings were reluctantly returned to Maria Altman, seen here. They were displayed for three weeks in Los Angeles and the opening night reception I was invited to attend. Soon afterwards, they were auctioned, they were to be auctioned by Sotheby's in New York City, who said, we will not take one penny in commission, but they were privately purchased by the estate of the Esther Lauder family to be part of the new Lauder Museum in New York City. The works, my friend, sold for a record amount of $431 million. Shortly after Maria Altman died at 88 years old, she bequeathed the money to the surviving members of her family. She gave vast sums to Los Angeles Opera Company and the Shoah Foundation, the Holocaust Museums Worldwide. She gave all of them a sizable endowment to continue their quest for peace and the survival of the Holocaust memories to 20 museums around the world. This riveting story was the subject of Hollywood's film, Woman in Gold, starring Helen Mirren as Maria Altman. And thus, my friends, the quest for justice continues, as does the love of his work. During the same period, his contemporary Egon Schiele, seen here in a self-portrait, was depicting the struggle of man in the new Western Europe. In the outbreak of World War II, while his contemporary composer, Albon Baird, wrote his monumental opera, Wozzeck, the story of man's inhumanity to man, she was saw landscapes were high demand. They reflect his roots in rural Austria and Bohemia. On the horizon was Friedrich Risch Hunderwasser, whose paintings and architecture slammed the contemporary architectural environment. 
seen here some of his monumental structures in current day Vienna. Seen here is the Hunterwasser House, a municipal apartment block created in 1985, who wished to strike a blow against what he saw as soulless modern architecture. These are some of his great creations that you can see and enjoy in Vienna. With its irregular bands of color and onion dome copulas, the buildings look more like a stage set from Hansel and Gretel than a block of council flats. To the observer, his art is alive, vibrant, and evokes a sense of happiness. He has greatly influenced other modern architecture, including that of the builder of the Guggenheim Museum and the LA Music Hall. He greatly influenced modern architecture to follow. Seen here, an artist's rendering of a new central train, train, train station, the Westbahnhof, in Vienna. Gustav Mahler, while the world of art was going through its transformation, the music establishment was going through tremendous change. Gustav Mahler, a young composer of Jewish roots, brought that change about. A typical composer, a product of the turn of the century, when Vienna was still the capital of multi-ethnic empire, and thus he produced magnets of which other artists and talent ambition were irresistibly drawn. Mahler, born in Bohemia, eventually migrated to Vienna from 1897 to 1907 as the director of the Vienna State Opera. He transformed the company from just a place of elegant entertainment to the finest institution of its kind in the world. He is credited with forming what was to become the New York Philharmonic. He was drawn to the bucolic settings of Austria, and his music reflected it as he was speaking the language of tomorrow with the vocabulary of yesterday. His influences were Beethoven and Wagner. His treasured chromaticism, you're listening to a little bit of his monumental fifth symphony. The expression in musical terms, the most profound mystical experience, heartfelt love of nature, uncompromising sincerity, and deep convictions, these were the basic ingredients of Mahler's personality in his life was work. When he was teaching, when I was teaching at the American School in Vienna in the 1970s, I had the fortunate experience of hearing all ten Mahler symphonies, not on one night. The resident conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic during that period was the venerated Leonard Bernstein, who was the champion of Mahler's music. In the spring of 72, he conducted the Fifth Symphony of Mahler along with a song cycle of opera singers included in Walter Berry and Krista Ludwig, whose son was in my sixth grade class at the American School. I want to play one little cut of her. She would come in for a conference and she said, my son loves your teaching. Would you like to see me in Carmen? And she'd give me two seats to the front of the opera house. Here she is singing from Sansone's. Einstein also accompanied an evening of Leontine Price and an evening of songs of Johann Brown, Johannes Brahms, an unforgettable evening. In Mahler's early years of composing, he was visited by the eminent French composer Jan Sibelius. And Mahler told him of being unfairly mauled by the critics of Vienna. In Sibelius, in his off comments, it kind of reminded me of Churchill, and he said to him, young man, always remember that nobody has ever put up a statue to a critic. Mahler died in May of 1911 at age 51 and buried in the wine district of Vienna in beautiful Grinsing. His impact on modern music. Viennese composer Richard Strauss was famous for his melodic ingeniouses, the late Romantic period, in a series of symphonic poems and song cycle. 
His opera's Electra, Salome, the Rosen Cavalier, his tone poems, the Heldon, Leave in a Hero's Life. His last four songs show his creative genius in musical portraiture. He conducted throughout Europe and the United States, and he taught the first semester in Los Angeles at UCLA. He lived 85 active years and died in 1949. His music enthusiastically performed today throughout the world. As did Wagner come for a period of two years and write in Vienna. I'm watching my time, folks, as I want to. Any overview of Vienna would not would be incomplete without least a mention of the great Austrian-Hungarian cuisine and variety, flavor and presentation paramount. These include the wonderful Viennese delicacies, the Wiener schnitzel, soccer tort, apple strudel, and roast rotten. A delightful stop at any of Vienna's numerous cafes will leave you wanting more. Vienna and Wolfgang Mozart. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. You know, he wrote there half of his life. And if you saw the movie Amadeus, which was not filmed in Vienna but in Prague because the director was Czech. And you remember, when he wrote the opera, The Magic Flute, he said to the emperor, well, how did you like it? And the emperor said, well, you know, it's really good, but it's just too much listening for a human being on one night. So Mozart says, well, your highness, what should I do? He said, well, just cut a few notes. And Mozart turned to him, as bold as he was, and he said, emperor, which ones? <laughs> anyway, that was a great film, one best picture. And our ending music will be the great Fritz Wunderlich, which even today Vienna considers herself the music capital of the world. When we consider the position of their great music houses, I encourage you to explore Vienna in the countryside. And understand beauty, idealism, aesthetics, tradition, and pride. Stroll the Ringstrasse. So let's listen to a little bit of Fritz Wunderlich. this lecture. Visit the pathway of the third man. Admire a climped countryside. Marvel at the Russian Orthodox Church in the center of Vienna. Admire a Bruegel. Attend an opera. Explore the Danube Valley. Attend a Beethoven concert with the Vienna Philharmonic. Dance with Johann Strauss and its many Viennese balls. Gaze at the opulent past. Explore Vienna woods. Explore Salzburg in summer, the most baroque city of the Alps, the name Salzburg meaning Stone Mountain. Visit the Alps anytime, stroll the grounds of the Schönbrunn Palace, or the town of Hallstatt with its roots in Stone Age man, the place much sought after salt mines founded between 800 and 400 BC. Here is beautiful Hallstatt. Walk through old and new Vienna in its beautiful countryside. Enjoy the beauty of winter in the Austrian Alps. Vienna and Austria will welcome you again and again. And dreams, my friends, do become realities. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. I look forward to seeing you. We will have a wonderful experience exploring the life of Luciano Pavarotti. But my last lecture on Broadway will not be here, but it'll be 9 o'clock in the Explorer's Lounge. So bring your drinks, bring your knitting, and come and enjoy Broadway in my last lecture. <laughs> So my name is Sharon Pfaff, I'm your naturalist on board, and today we're going to talk about the hula through the islands. We're going to start in Samoa, a long time ago, and we're going to get to Tahiti, and then on to Hawaii. 
and you'll see different uh, ways in which the dance has progressed throughout those islands and the costumes and the instruments that they use. And I also would love to thank the lovely lady who left me this beautiful ornament that she must have made. Looks like one that I don't know where she is now. Could you raise your hand? Where is she? Up here. Oh, up there. Thank you very much. It's beautiful, beautiful. So, um, yeah, we're going to get started here. Let me uh, start this going. So where we're going to be going is to Samoa. We're going to start in Samoa, the country of Samoa. And then we're going to go to Polynesia. And Polynesia is a red star, French Polynesia. And then we're going to come up to Hawaii, to Hawaii. So we're going to start in Samoa. Now, where the people came from in Samoa is actually from the Taiwan areas up there. That's where their DNA comes from. So they headed down all the different islands, down, 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 and finally made it to Samoa. Um, the islands were pretty well close together, so they didn't have a lot, to, a lot of um, canoeing to go very far. And there was miles, you know, there could have been a hundred miles or more between some of the islands. But basically the island jumped down and they've been in Samoa 3,000 years. 3,000 years. So I don't have any pictures from that far back <laughs> because there weren't any. In fact, we don't have much written language either from any of the islands. Um, so we don't have a lot of their stories. Everything was passed down. Everything was passed down. So we're going to start in Samoa. Samoa is known as the sacred earth. They're very, very attached to the earth. The families there. They have owned the property that they're on for generations upon generations upon generations. You actually, it's very difficult to buy any property in Samoa. It's already in the hands of the people who live there. And they don't want to give it up, of course. So we're going to go back in time. And this is where um, you see the old building and the new building look very similar. Okay, the old building has a thatched roof. The new building has a tin roof, right? Very different, but much easier to maintain than the thatch roofs. But basically, the same buildings are all over the island of, in Samoa, the island, all of their islands. And um, this is their family gathering. This is where they do everything, is in this building. This is where they eat, this is where they sleep, this is where they dance, this is where they have their meetings, this is where they just hang out during the day. The food is cooked in a different building and then brought into this one for them all to eat together. And they have lots of family gatherings and then they may have gatherings with other families that join them. And so this was where they also practiced hula, where they practiced their dance and a very important building in their families. The people who were in charge of the families were called the Matai. Matai could be a man or a woman, and they became the chief of that, of that family, basically, um, by doing good deeds. And the more good deeds they did, the higher their decoration on their head was. So the higher it was, you knew that that person was more important to the family than anyone else. And as I said, it could be a woman, it could be a man. It didn't matter to them. And um, the outfits that you see here are really what they used to wear and how they used to decorate their bodies. So if you look at it very closely, you see no flowers. There is no flowers, okay? So they had no fabric either. So the cloth that they're wearing is actually beaten bark. Beaten bark, hard, 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 soft till it gets so soft it's like soft leather. It's beautiful. And then they would decorate that. But a lot of work goes into making the fabric. And they didn't need a lot because they're in the tropics. So clothes were not a big issue for people who live in the tropics. And, um, and so this was very, 
very much what they wore. And when they did dances and when they had celebrations, they would get more dressed up like this. And their decorations like around her neck are boar's tusks. That's what's around her neck. And also shells, lots of shells. They would use shells. They would use seeds. Okay, they would use feathers because they had chickens, they had birds. So they would use feathers as decoration, okay? Um, and they're very heavy. They're very heavy on top of their heads. Now they didn't wear this every day. They wore this only for special occasions and things like that. But um, they, they did like to get dressed up. The normal dress, that's a painting on the left side, is how the men dressed. That's basically all they were, with some wraparound cloth, some of the top up. Some of this might be cloth by the time that picture was made, okay? And in the center, you see the ladies dress for dancing. These were their dancing attire. Again, no flowers. You're not gonna see flowers. We're not gonna see flowers for a long time in these islands. So what they have are seeds and beads and shells, and uh, boar's teeth, maybe shark's teeth, things like that, that they decorate themselves with. The person who's in the middle is, of course, a matai. She is the most important with the highest headdress, right? The highest headdress. The drums that they used, and they only had drums, were hollowed out logs, up here on the right side in the picture, hollowed out logs that they hit with a stick. And that's what they kept trying to time to the dances was those hollowed out logs, okay? The men, dancers, they didn't wear anything but a wrap around either cloth or beaten bark around their waist. That's all they wear, that's all they wear now. The men's attire hasn't changed uh, at all. Women's has definitely changed as we, as we know. Uh, women's outfits change well yearly, right? <laughs> Pretty much. So we have a then picture. This was taken in the uh, 1800s. Okay, this picture on the left. And again, you see that there's, there's no flowers. You're not gonna see any flowers. And over here, this was taken not very long ago in Apia, um, Samoa, when they were dancing for us on the dock. As the ship comes in, and actually, they start dancing as they see us coming in, and they don't stop for at least an hour or more out there. It's quite wonderful. It's one of our best receptions that we come into, into any port, um, because they are so happy to see us. They're so friendly, and they are loving to dance, and it gives them an opportunity to do that. But if you notice that the attire is a little different, again, no flowers, Feathers, those are feathers in their hair, not uh, flowers. And seeds around their neck and shells around their neck, okay? And very differently dressed, of course, because fabric came into play. And uh, it was really interesting. They say when they first got the fabric, they, did, they didn't want to wear it. No, they wanted to hang it on their walls because it was so beautiful inside of their uh, places that they had. So. It was a, a whole different look at fabric because they didn't figure they needed fabric to wear. They were pretty comfortable the way they were. So this is another picture of now on the left side, okay? This is how they dress and this is how they dress all the time, not just for dancing. The women wear a top with uh, generally uh, short sleeves but it comes down over their waist, and then they have a long skirt that's under the top. They are always dressed like this. This is what their normal dress is and what they walk around in every day. You would think it'd be really warm, but I think they're getting used to it over the years, right? And this is what they first started wearing when they started putting on performances for um, the explorers, the people that were now coming to the islands. So they covered their breasts, yes. Um, but other than that, they still wore the just straight kind of fabric or pounded bark when they danced. And 
they still had no other instruments either. So I'm going to show you a little bit. This is what happens when we come in, into dock. Whoop, sorry. Went over it. There we go. The women almost always sit when they're dancing. The men make lots of noise and usually are up dancing around them, trying to disturb them. You notice you only hear the drum. stance, but it will tell you that the women take tiny little steps. They're not, they're very smooth as they walk across. They're very deliberate in their movements, where the men are not. The men are not. Now these men in the back of this one don't move around a lot, but they do make a lot of noise. Notice that still no flowers. No flowers. Very different. The, and that's how they dance now. They've danced the same way basically for thousands of years. Long time. Long time. Different outfits. This, this was taken at the Robert Louis Stevenson's mansion, which is also a uh, museum in Apia. So, wonderful place to stop. And they're also known, the Samoans are known for the best fire dancers of all the islands anywhere. Just, uh, they have that um, different way in which they do it, and they do it with lots of fire. And um, one of the things that they developed was actually, when they finally got metal, they started learning how to put the oils on the sword and be able to do it with the sword, the sword dancing. And that became very popular. You don't see much of that anymore. Sometimes uh, you're very lucky to see the, the sword fire dancers, but it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And uh, these were also taken because we stayed later in Apia a couple of times, and they did fire dancing for us on the, right on the dock. It was really pretty cool. But they left, they left Samoa. Now we don't know why. We don't know if there was a famine, if there was overpopulation, if they were kicked out, if they lost a war, we don't know what happened. All we know is that they left Samoa and they started traveling on the, on the double hole canoes across open ocean. Now there was not very many close islands to Samoa, 
So they had to go a long distance. And navigators had very high status in all of these places that we're going to visit. Navigators, because how they traveled was on the ocean. And so it was very important that you had people who knew how to read the ocean. And that's exactly what I'm saying. They read the ocean. The navigators were just so in touch with nature, so in touch with nature, that they could taste the water and know how close they were to islands. They could read the clouds, because clouds gather more above islands than in different ways, in different shapes, than they do in just general sky. The stars they use, the birds, the, way, the animals that swam in the ocean, the dolphins, they read all of that, and that was their job. That was their life thing that they did, and they passed that information on to their sons, and to their sons, and to their sons. Okay. So they were just so, so enmeshed in nature that they could lead them to other places, even not knowing where those other places might actually be, might actually be. So they left Samoa and they went to Polynesia, or to French Polynesia right now, or to Tahiti. Tahiti was not populated at the time that they got there. So they were like the first ones there. And it was about 800 miles by open ocean. 800 miles, pretty much straight across, straight across. You know, that was a long distance for them. Some made it, some didn't make it. Some went down to New Zealand, and those were the Maoris. The Maoris went to, they were a tribe in Samoa. They left all in a group, basically, and went to New Zealand. They, are, they were a very boring tribe, no question about it. And they would decorate themselves. Remember, they had no metal, no metal. We're not speaking metal now. They had no metal, so their biggest defense was how ugly they could be. So they would tattoo their faces, their bodies, and they would make these grimaces, right? Because all their battles were done face to face, face to face. And their whole purpose was to scare the um, opponent that they had. And they would yell and, and had these, these uh, chants that they would do, these war chants that they would do that would stir up everybody. And even the women, the women fought with them too, which is unusual. But the women also fought. And you see those white balls around their waist, okay? A lot of people think those are like, you know, things that they play with for you when you're seeing them uh, do the Maori dances, right? Uh, however, they are, they are instruments of death. What they would do is they would swing them like this and throw them to wrap around the necks to kill their enemies. Or grab their arm that had a, might have a wooden spear in it so that the spear couldn't be thrown. So yes, they were not these cute little toys that you can make fancy things in the air with. They were specifically war instruments. But other people went to the Tahitian Islands. The Tahitian Islands. They found the islands beautiful, gorgeous, lovely. Not very big, but very nice compared to Samoa, which is a little older island, so they are a little more um, degraded. The islands are older, so they're been around a lot more and longer. But they came to these islands, and it was like a paradise, a paradise. But they set up a very strict system for this island. And one of the strict systems was that their whole purpose was they didn't come with many people. They had to populate the islands. They had to have more and more people. So their dancing is always directed at sexual attraction. No matter how you see them now, no matter what you see, in Tahiti, those dances have always been about procreation. Okay? They, however, brought the, the, the little drums, because they were easy to uh, carry on the canoes, but they also, when they got to Tahiti, they started using these big drums, because they were much louder 
and you could hear them from long distances. Okay? And that was one of the ways in which they communicated with these drums, but it's also what they used in the dances. The drums were made from either hollowed out um, um, palm trees or trees, because they had trees, lots of trees on um, Tahiti. Okay, so, and the top of them was dried shark skin. Okay, dried shark skin, that's what they used for the, what we would use the leather for, right, usually. Now it's plastic, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> and, and that's when the conch shells got started in calling other people to come or to announce when the chiefs are coming through to get out of the way basically, to let the common folk move out of the way so that they didn't disturb the chiefs as they walk through or try to kill them, you know, whatever was going on at that time. So the um, drums were very beautiful. And if you go to the back side, you can see how carved they did. They did a lot more carving and a lot more decorating of their drums. Still not wearing, these are traditional clothes, still not wearing clothes because they didn't need clothes. They lived in the tropics. Tahiti is very tropical. And uh, they actually prefer not wearing clothes in Tahiti still, if they can get away with it in different places. Now there's so many tourists that they have changed their ways a little bit, a little bit, yes. But um, the music was incredible. They did bring with them the headgear even though they weren't necessarily um, the special people in their tribes. But it was decoration, it was things that they could wear on their bodies that, that looked good when they were dancing. And they're very heavy, they're all, no flowers. No, nah, not gonna see flowers. No flowers, shells, beads, sticks, um, top of cloth, you know, um, braided, all kinds of things. Very heavy, very heavy. If you notice that almost all hula dancers have long hair, and how they kept those on was tying them on with their hair, with their hair to keep them really tight because once you start dancing, particularly Tahitian dancing, you don't want those to fall off, right? That, that would not look good. <laughs> So they tied them on with their hair, okay? And um, to this day, they still do that. Now, Tahitian dancers still wear this headgear, and if you, look, if you can look closely at some of this, it's all shells. It's all shells, it's all feathers. It is not uh, any flowers. You don't see flowers. Same on her headdress, even though her skirt is, of course, not real. It's dyed something. but. Um, her headdress is all feathers and all shells, you know, because she's doing a dance actually at the Merry Monarch. The men's now use these kind of outfits to dance in when they dance, which is kind of um, what would be considered a grass skirt, right? But again, no flowers, all shells, all shells. And they dance basically to the drums. So we're going to have a little one here. Now this is in a um, contest, okay? So we're gonna show you a ladies dance. Remember what I said about their dancing. They have 
flowers in their hair, but only because it's a modern contest that they're in. Very good exercise. Tahiti. Tahiti was too small. The islands were too small. It was getting overpopulated or fighting between groups and um, maybe illness. Maybe some were sent away. Maybe some left because there was so much illness. Could have been. But about a thousand AD, they left Tahiti. Only they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know where they were heading. They only had some inkling from their navigators that there were more islands out there. But they took everything with them on these canoes. They were huge canoes. They could hold about 30, 40 people, all the rations for them, and the canoe plants. They took with them plants that they know they would need to have wherever they got to. And hopefully they got to a place where they would grow. So they brought coconuts and breadfruit and taro and tea leaves, not the tea you drink, but the big plant, the big tea leaf plant, because they used it so much. They brought pahalas, which are um, uh, a plant that they can get lots of uh, webbing off of so that they can do their matting, make their mats. They took everything with them, and they had to, they had to know they were going to have to survive for maybe weeks, maybe months at a time before they find any islands. And that's true, because they went from French Polynesia, or Tahiti at that time, straight up across the equator to Hawaii. That is 2,400 miles. Long canoe ride. And they had to survive that canoe ride. They had to go through the storms. They had to go across the equator. They had to go through heat. Hot, hot, hot heat, hotter than was in their islands, and cold and storms. It was a very treacherous journey on these canoes. Some made it, some did not make it. But when they got within Hawaii's range, they could see the volcanoes. The volcanoes have been going off for thousands, forever, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So they thought there were very strong gods on these islands to have the uh, volcanoes there making the islands. So that was very important to them. Not that they wanted to get close to that, because they really didn't, but they could go around at different sides of the island and get to where there was no eruptions going on. And then they found these beautiful, beautiful places where everything grew, including all their canoe plants. All their canoe plants. So they established themselves in the Hawaiian Islands about a thousand years ago. And um, it's a, everything grows. Everything grows. So they cleared places that they needed to do. They brought, brought in water from above the mountains, so they had plenty of fresh water. Um, they had great waterways. They put out huge, huge um, uh, gardens where they grew all their vegetables. And they, of course, had plenty of fish, because their ocean is full of the fish. And they had plenty of other animals, like turtles and monk seals and so many things that they could either eat or use lots of the parts and pieces of all those animals, right? They had whales. They had so many things that they could live by. They prospered. They were under a very strict social system because when the first group got there, they put up, the, that chief put up the, so the rules of the kapu system. From, they brought it from Tahiti to Hawaii. They just embellished on it, and they did a lot more to it. When they arrived, what was most important in their culture was the war gods, the war gods. So they built many temples to the war gods, or heiaus, they're called heiaus. Those are the stone 
walled sections that became the temples. There they did lots of sacrifices to the gods, thanking them for having found this very bountiful place that they moved to, thanking them for whatever, the, the sun, the everything. They had 60, 60 gods or more that they, that they acknowledged to, right? Very, very important were the war gods because, of course, they fought among themselves, too. For land, even though there was lots of land to go around at that time, they still wanted their peace and they didn't want anybody else on it. And the same, 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 it always goes on. So they continued to fight even among themselves. But very often the chiefs uh, kept things pretty, pretty tight. And the hula was kind of hmm, not really used that much, except for acknowledging and gaining strength and favor from the gods. So the only ones that could do hula were the men. Women were not allowed to do hula, the dance. They were not allowed to do a lot of things. They couldn't do, they couldn't be in the canoes, they couldn't be, they couldn't eat bananas, they couldn't eat pork, they couldn't uh, eat with men. Men and women never ate together during the kapu system. Never ate together. That was kapu, which means don't do that. That's basically what that means. So it's a very, very strict system. Now it worked also for all kinds of things. You don't fish this type of fish during this time because that's when they reproduce. You don't do this during that time because that's when they, the plants get flowers on them or get more things on them. They didn't have a lot of flowers either in the beginning. So they only danced for the alii or their chiefs, okay? And the chiefs would have the women dance also, but only at special ceremonies and occasions. Mostly it was the men dancing. Women couldn't watch them dance. Mm -mm. Women couldn't watch them dance. It was only for men and specifically for the chiefs that the hula halaus, that's a dance troupe, happened. So they didn't bring the drums with them. They were too big, I guess, to put on those, those canoes for that long a time. So they didn't really bring drums with them, but they had gourds. And gourds became what they used to keep time to the dances, was gourds. They dried them out, they kept the seeds in some, and that creates, if you saw the picture with the, the, the guy in the middle here, what he's holding is a feather wrapped gourd, which is what we still use for uh, dancers. Now we use chicken feathers, not bird feathers. Well, chickens are birds, but not the fancy bird feathers. So, because you can't get those now. So, what they do is they dry the seeds out, so this is like a rattle. This is like a rattle in there, but it's a gourd, right? A gourd surrounded by feathers. They also would use bamboo, which is down below the pool of the E, which is, to, which is bamboo that's slit. So when you hit it, it makes a noise. When you hit it, it makes a noise. Also around his feet, around his ankle, his uh, calves, this woven cloth from, from pahala, woven um, pahala stems, and he attaches seed, uh, shells in there, or seeds, could be seeds, but it's mostly shells, so that when he dances, the shells make a rattle noise, different than the seeds in the, in the um, gourds. The kane, that's the men, danced the kihiko hula, which is the ancient dance, okay? And very little of that is done anymore, except in competitions, or in specific shows that you go to, the kahiko, because it's very, very difficult. And as I said, dance, dance only with the oli, which is chanting, mele, which is song, and gourds. That's all they use. So we're gonna look at how they trained. I think a lot of people look at hula as just women dancing. But um, we love it, man. Hula is a story. To tell the story the way the ancient Hawaiians did, you really need to put yourself in that dance. You need to live like them. 
You need to chant like them. You need to train like them. Basically, you need to become them. How long is the hula school? We perform all over the world. In ancient times, warriors are actually recruited from the halal. The chief would come to look from the ranks of the advanced male dancers, warriors were selected. The philosophy of our halal is to kind of replicate that. For male kula, we're basically telling warrior stories. And to dance like a warrior, you need to train like a warrior. We train in a private piece of land on the west side of Oahu, using only what ancient Hawaiians had. Whether it's rocks, the sand, the ocean. When we come to practice, we expect to die. It's strenuous on the legs, but it's also to train your mind. I tell myself, and the rest of the boys, if I fall, it's because my body just gave up. One of the hardest workouts we do would be climbing the coconut tree. Sometimes you reach the top and your legs are shaking because you know, you're holding your weight. And to look down, knowing that nothing's holding you, you gotta kind of have this warrior mindset. It's like, you know, that this is what I want, you know, I'm gonna get this. You know, when these gentlemen come to Hula, they're like a ball of clay. That's Kumu. I look at it as my responsibility to shape them into better individuals, better fathers, better sons, better brothers. Our goal is that when these men are done dancing, that they leave here better people. What hula does for me culturally, it still takes me back to, to how Hawaii used to be. People sometimes are losing that aloha for each other, that love for each other. And hula just gives you that reality check, man. I'm dancing until my kneecaps fall off. And even after that, I'm gonna do whatever I can for the halal. You know, we have this brotherhood where we take care of each other. We help push each other. It's my passion and I, I look forward to seeing where Hula takes me in life. So, we're gonna show a little dance here. This is done at the Mary Monarch, which is a festival um, done once a year in Hilo, Hawaii. It is known as the top festival all over the world. And this is that same group of men that are gonna be dancing. The weekend of Ramrod used to load the cannon. This procreation chant, or Mele Mai, honors the Ali'i Kua Nui Kui of Mele. And now from Hawaii Anai, Oahu. Kua Hula, O'Brien and Esseto. And the men of Hekai Kahiki.
Toad. Have you ever seen Hula like that? Probably not. Probably not. Would you like to study for the Hula like that? <laughs> no. And yes, it's only done by the younger group also. Um, and it's enormous amount of power. And that's what the chiefs were looking for because they fought face to face. They wanted the strongest men. And uh, that's about as strong as you can get, as you saw those guys uh, being able to do what they do. The women also danced the ancient hula, kahiko, not quite like what they just saw. But if you look at their outfits, it's basically the same. This is just made from cloth, from beaten bark, excuse me, from beaten bark, right? And all the different designs that they actually would paint on them. Right? So very similar in their what they danced in. Now, King Kalakau is the one that started up the Merry Monarch Festival. We started it up for him about oh, 60 years ago now, I think. He was passed, of course. But while he was king, um, after the missionaries had got settled into Hawaiian islands and had put clothes on everyone and taken away a lot of their, a lot of their things they took away because they didn't want to show anybody. They didn't want to do them in front of the uh, missionaries, but the missionaries uh, wanted to definitely put clothes on them, which was very unusual for a very hot tropic area. And, um, but, and so Hula kind of just disappeared because they didn't want to do it in front of anybody who didn't appreciate what they were doing. And so it kind of disappeared, and then uh, along with that went their language, because they had to speak English. They got a, the missionaries put together a alphabet for them so that everything could be written down for the Bible. They wanted the Bible written in a language that they could read. We had the most literate group in the world, actually, in Hawaii because of the going to school with the missionaries and learning how to read and write. Even in the United States, it was in the mainland of the United States, because it wasn't a state when he did this, but um, there was no other place that had so many of the populations that could actually read and write. Read and write, it's very, very interesting. Hawaii has a lot of firsts, and people don't think about that one, right? But what he did was he brought back the hula. He brought it back. He started having huge luau's, which are big parties. Those parties went for weeks. They weren't just an afternoon. No, 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 no. People came. They stayed. They ate. They drank. They do dancing. They play music, and then they'd sleep, and then they'd get up, and they'd eat and drink and have a great time and do storytelling and all of that stuff for weeks at a time. Cost the, their coffers a lot. And by that time, he also was the one that built the Iolani Palace, the first palace and only real palace in the United States. And it had electricity before the White House and before the, uh, the Parliament in um, London. We had electricity in Hawaii. Cost a fortune to put all that in. And he used up most of the coffers that was bequeathed to him from previous kings. However, he did bring back a lot of the culture of Hawaii, and he is very um, honored for that, and that's what the Mary Monarch Festival is about. It is a great festival. You will find halaus, which are Luke Hula schools, all over the world now. Basically, every country, if they've heard of Hawaii, if they've seen the hula, they now have halaus mostly women. Very few men halaus. They're almost all women now who do hula of all ages because hula, the kind that is done in Hawaii, can be done by anybody, basically. They, um, you can do slow or you can do fast. You can do, it's amazing. When you go to a party, people just get up and start dancing. They just start dancing to the, to the music any age from little to the elders. Yes, yes, they do. It's quite wonderful. They get all their instruments out, and it's, it's just terrific. 
But what happened was that Hula became very famous in the early 18, late 1800s, early 1900s. Hula became a showstopper at all the fairs across the United States and in England when they did it there. Yes, Hula was a place. Only women, no men came to do these Hulas and the, and the fairs. But it became very, very popular. And then what happened was Hollywood got in the picture and they changed a few things. They put the ladies in coconut bras, which are very uncomfortable, I might say. And most of them not big enough for most of us. And <coughs> they also had grass skirts. There was never grass skirts until Hollywood came along. And the same with the flower lays. That basically happened when Hollywood came along, right? Now it's very popular. All of those things are very popular. The original skirts that they used were the tea leaf leaves from the tea leaf that I told you came in the canoe plants. That not only made uh, jackets for the men if they were up in the cold weather, but it also was what they used for skirts, for skirts, for wearing, okay? Sometimes they had the full leaves like these are. They're very long leaves. Or they stripped them, and then they'd look more like the grass skirt, right? Because it'd be strips of the leaf. So uh, very interesting. We still, you will still find people doing the um, leaves for their skirts. One of the things, if you're a hula dancer and if you're in a halal, you have to make all.